Hello, and welcome to the Pacific Southwest MHTTC's new program, Rising Practices and Policies in Our Workforce, the Spring and Summer Learning Series. We're so happy to have you join us today. My name is Rochelle Espiritu, and I'm our region's co-director, and I'll be moderating today's session. So today we're gonna to be offering a brief introduction to our series, an overview of 988. And then we will get to hear from incredible regional leaders about rising practices and policies that bring us hope and caution as we prepare for the July launch of 988 and the integration of the hotline thereafter. As you may know, this is the first session of a four-part series, and I wanted to just share a little bit about some of the other ones. We have designed four sessions that reflect rising issues that we know are impacting our mental and, our, our mental and school mental health workforce. So let's go ahead and turn to today's focus, which is on launching um, 988. What do we need to know and how might it go? So we're here to listen today to our regional leaders who will be sharing opportunities and challenges um, through a systems transition. And it's kind of amazing to think about what this is going to be like. Some of you might be completely new to 988 and some of you may have a better understanding or have been exposed to more of it more recently. So whatever level you are entering into today's conversation, we really encourage you to ask questions, to offer your own resources, and know that this is the start of our region's 988 support because we can only do so much in 75 minutes. So we're really thinking about this as a highlight of what to expect in this region. Um, we're also hoping that we will be able to offer some follow up in the fall after some implementation has occurred. So make sure you're on our listserv and, and can learn a little bit more about that. Um, our panel is going to explain much more about 988 and its implementation promises and challenges, but let's let's talk a little bit about what 988 is. Um, so on your slide here, you can see that on July 16th, there will be a three digit national mental health crisis hotline, which is mandated by the federal government in October of 2020, and it will launch nationwide. So when people call or text or chat to 988, they will be, they'll be connected to some trained counselors who are part of a, an existing referral pathway, a crisis continuum, or the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline Network member. Um, so we know that every state is a little bit different in, in terms of who people will be connected with. Um, this is also an expansion of the, there will also be an expansion of the current National Prevention Lifeline program to effectively triage respond and stabilize individuals who are experiencing a mental health crisis, which we know will require a real significant expansion in our workforce and some training as well. We're excited to have a very um, diverse panel that is rich with expertise from our diversity of roles from county to state and private systems. Um, we're also, we're pleased that David, Margie, CJ, and Kelly are here to offer each of their viewpoints. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. So my name is David Lopez, and I'm the program manager of the suicide, uh, Central Valley Suicide Prevention Hotline. And I've been in that capacity for the past five years, uh, where we've taken a relatively small call center and grown it to, we're actually a national backup center. Last year, we fielded about 77 crisis calls from the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Uh, so it was a great, it's been a great experience. Previous to that, I was a clinician of actual that worked with rural triage, which uh, with mobile crisis teams in the field with police departments. And I have worked in an inpatient unit as a, as a crisis and a crisis stabilization unit. So that's how all my worlds came together. And what I would like to share to you is just a little bit more about what 988 is and what that looks like in our region, how California has been preparing, how we are preparing and what we can look on expecting. So as was mentioned earlier, what is 988? So 988 is uh, going to be the new front facing number for those that can access services who are in a mental health or suicidal crisis. 
uh, what the thought or that was is that uh, when people are in a crisis, that this new new uh, number would be easier uh, for people to remember than the 1-800-273-8255 number. So with that shortening number, it will help improve the quality of service and hopefully uh, make it easier for someone uh, to remember. It will launch on July 16th, 2020. And that will uh, start, It's already, the number's already in place and it was, with meaning it's tied in already to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline Network already. Uh, with that, this is going to be pretty intensive uh, work that's been going on for the past 18 months since this law passed, that every crisis center is working diligently to make sure our technologies match up, that everything will be patched in. And that's uh, what the initial stage of it is for it is. You know, and the whole idea behind 988, uh, it's starting off with uh, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline piece. But the idea behind this is this in time. Um, when you call 911 and you need your house is on fire, uh, you can get a fire department and they're going to come and respond to you. With that being said, when we call 911 and we're in a mental health crisis, we often are received with like law enforcement or and that may not be the most appropriate response, good intentions. And then they go to EDs and they're actually not served the best way. So the long-term approach is to increase the capacity of everything, but the first time is to attach into the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And what the Lifeline is, is a, a collective of 200 centers across the nation. And what we do is we provide suicidal emotional support and we treat crisis and suicidal, um, both emotional distress, emotional crisis and suicidal crisis with the same level and care of respect. And this is a free service to our community and it, uh, it operates 24, seven, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week in the United States. So as I just mentioned, the 988 dialing code is the first step towards uh, strengthening the trans and strengthening and transforming the crisis care in our country. Uh, so the goal behind this will be that universal entry point. So no matter where you live, you can reach a crisis, a trained crisis counselor who can help you. And in the lifeline, it's a direct connection to someone who is trained and who is, you know, is going to have that ability to actually engage in a crisis de-escalation process with you. And what that looks like is we really want to join with our, with the individuals who call and working on what we can do, meet them where they're at. And what the Lifeline's goal is to, is really help uh, unpack some of the things that are going on, slow down the situation, right. assess if they are at risk for suicide, and then we are definitely always looking at, okay, are you currently having a plan? We assess for the risk. And then we look at, you know, disengaging that, that plan, helping them get into a safer space. And then we try to offer different resources, uh, create safety plans with them. We do have the capacity to activate uh, emergency rescue or what we call an active rescue. And that is usually done in a um, collaborative approach uh, we like to take the least invasive method possible to engage that support uh, because we know the actual what can look like if law enforcement or someone comes to your house, how that can be embarrassing. So we really try to do that. But if necessary, we will activate uh, emergency rescue to preserve life. And that's our main goal. So in the short term, what's been happening is... Um, 988 will be strengthening and expanding our current lifeline service center infrastructure. And that was the first phase to that. So what we've been doing right now in the state of California, or for what California has done is they allocated $20 million in funding for California, which were very beneficial to that, to help enhance the capacity of the lifeline. Now, this is a one-time injection of funding. Half of that funding will be to create a new electronic or a new AHR record for us so we can have a more robust and complete data sharing system so we can get real-time data, what's going on in the field. Uh, and the other part of that will to be have a new training platform. So all the, the 13 crisis centers in California will be able to have a universal uh, platform for us to uh, share some trainings 
and have a standardized training for every crisis center. Um, all crisis centers that are part of the 988 Collaborative or the Lifeline Network are accredited. All of them in California are accredited by the American Association of Suicidology. Uh, part of this goal, again, is to increase the capacity of the call center, which we expect uh, the call volumes will double once the launch of 988. And this is a really powerful initiative for us because this, this is the first time we're getting such a, uh, there's a big spotlight on the mental health and the suicide prevention efforts in this country. When I was at the American Association Conference of Suicidology Conference last week, they were mentioning that the proposed budget for this year for mental health is at 700 million and previously it was at 40 million. So this is a wonderful opportunity for us to actually increase the services across the board and get people the care and support that they need. Um, part of the, the, our California structure is that is increase the text and chat uh, in every crisis center. So it's not just the calls, but we should all are expected to have some capacity of support for text and chat by 20 and 23, by 2023. And all um, California crisis centers are expected by uh, 2024 to have text and chat up and running. Uh, we're currently and actively recruiting uh, new crisis counselors for our centers right now to meet the need of that anticipated uh, double call volume that we're looking at uh, across the nation right now. And as I spoke, I actually spoke at the National Conference of Suicidology, all of the, all the crisis centers that were there have mentioned the same, uh, are working very diligent to recruit uh, individuals to get them at a, uh, to meet this need. So that's, that's a good thing. And I'm glad that we're all on the same page and we're really working towards um, recruiting individuals that actually, that have, are caring and empathetic naturally, and we can train the additional skills for them as well. Uh, one thing we do know is that not every, across the nation, not every uh, county has a mobile crisis team. And that's a long-term goal that we have uh, for 988 and that push. For example, in my region, I serve seven counties Three of them have mobile crisis units already stood up, but not one of them is 24-7 uh, yet. So really checking in with your local departments of behavioral health and what services are available are a good starting point. And then as we move forward, the goal will be for 988 is for us to be able to, as we integrate our systems, the 911 diversion piece, moving closer to that, all right, so with that, we will go ahead and move on to our next speaker, who is Margie. And so my name is Margie Balfour. I'm a psychiatrist. I work for an organization called Connections Health Solutions. We operate crisis centers, the Crisis Response Center in Tucson, which I'll be talking about, also the Urgent Psychiatric Center up in Phoenix and soon to be in some other states as well. I'm the Chief of Quality and Clinical Innovation. I'm also on faculty at the University of Arizona. And I'm gonna be talking from the local perspective. I'm kind of like, Dave, like David mentioned, you, when you ever you mentioned 911, you can't really talk about 911 without your brain immediately thinking about the response that happens, the you know, EMS and hospitals and emergency rooms and level one trauma centers and level two trauma centers, et cetera. And so kind of the promise of 988 is to be able to have a similarly robust system for mental health and substance use crisis. And it took decades for the, the me medical system to get to where it is. And Arizona has been working for you know, a couple of decades on its crisis system. And so while it's not perfect, it is close to, to kind of that promise. That's what I'll be talking about today. So this is a schematic that shows how we're organized. And in Arizona, all of the providers all contract up to a regional behavioral health authority that raids funding from, from multiple sources, which is um, all under our Medicaid department, which CJ will be talking about a little bit later. But all of us providers provide the different um, you know, aspects of, of crisis care, but are aligned towards these common goals through the oversight and the leadership of our regional behavioral health authority, which for the Southern region, which is what I'm talking about is um, Arizona Complete Health. And the way it works is everything is lined up in this 
continuum of least restrictive, least intrusive, which if you're being fiscally responsible with taxpayer funds also tend to be least costly. And so when the person in crisis calls, um, we've had crisis lines in Arizona for you know 20 years or so. And um, so you call these crisis lines, the one for the Southern region, it's about 10,000 calls a month. And like David talked about what he described, that's what they do. They have telephonic counseling, they have trained counselors. They also though can inter interact with the system. Um, for example, the Regional Behavioral Health Authority, which we say REBA for short, um, they're, they tell the clinics to, that they have to put crisis appointments into the software that the crisis line has. And so if part of what it takes to resolve your crisis at two in the morning is to say, well, we have a new appointment for tomorrow at 1130 at this clinic and here's the address, they're able to do that. Um, for the crises that aren't able to be resolved on the phone, then there are mobile teams for Pima County, which is where where I am, which is where Tucson is, there's about 16 mobile crisis teams that you know are staggered throughout the day, and they are typically two-person teams of of clinicians, and they um, they respond to crises out in the field. And if they're able to do a face-to-face -face assessment with someone, then about 70% of those get resolved. So again, you're you're resolving people's crisis without having to bring them in somewhere, or or to have the police involved. Um, for those that do need a higher level of care, then we have our crisis facilities. Um, the, the main one for Pima County is the Crisis Response Center where I am. Um, there, there's also others throughout that whole, whole region. Um, and these are centers where anyone can come in, they can walk in, um, have a, an urgent care appointment and get their needs met via like a brief visit, or they can be you know, coming in you know, really high acuity, suicidal, intoxicated, um, and most of those folks are able to get their needs met in an overnight observation um, type service where um, they are seen by interdisciplinary group of psychiatrists, nurse practitioners, nurses, peers, um, social workers, and get their crisis resolved so that they can go on to community-based care rather than have to go to the hospital. Um, for people who need further crisis stabilization, there are post-crisis wraparound services. Um, there's some that are peer run. There are various crisis residential, crisis respite type services for people who maybe need to step down or they could go directly to that level of care if they don't need to go to like a crisis facility. And with these different services, then most people are able to remain stable in the community. Now, at every point along here, we are trying to, um, res we're trying to keep people with mental health and substance use needs, not only out of the emergency rooms and out of the hospitals, but out of jail and without, and you know, out of, out of the criminal justice system. And if you're trying to do that, it's the police that have the people who bring them to jail in the first place. So uh, one of their, our system values is that we are trying to treat law enforcement as a preferred customer to make it easy for them to do the right thing. They get all this training on how to recognize signs and symptoms of mental illness, but if you don't make it easy for them to bring someone to treatment, then you know police agencies are understaffed and they're under lots of, of pressure and the jail becomes the path of least resistance if they're gonna have to wait for 12 hours with somebody at the emergency room. So at every point along here, there's this easy access preferred customer idea built in. So the crisis line has staff that are co-located at the 911 call center. And so they're able to intercept calls and have them go through this clinical pathway and completely bypass the 911 police you know, justice pathway. Um, for, for mobile crisis, they're, sorry about that. Um, for mobile crisis, the contracts that they have with the REBA for if, a, if I call and I'm in crisis at my house, um, the mobile team has an hour to get to me, but if police are in the field and they need a mobile team, they have a half hour. So there's things like that that are built in to incentivize um, uh, mobile crisis in, in law enforcement. 
And then um, at the crisis centers, they are really set up to make it easier and faster to bring someone to treatment rather than to jail. Um, our law enforcement turnarounds five to 10 minutes. No one is ever refused regardless of how agitated and how, you know, how acute they are. Um, or even if they're medically unstable, we'll take care of that and get them transferred. So, um, so if you put all that together, then you have decreased use of emergency rooms and jails and hospitals. To illustrate that as a crisis system gets more and more robust, you can think about the crisis a little differently as well. We hear a whole lot about co-responders. And um, as, as time goes on and you've got more of a robust system, it, we see it more as a collaborative response rather than a co-response. Co-response is one of many tools that, that you can use to collaborate. And the crisis, we talk a lot about the acute crisis and the, the, you know, where you need urgently someone to respond. But there's after the crisis, as it's resolving or as the crisis is developing, there's opportunity to prevent and intervene there as well. And those sorts of things can kind of break the cycle. So if you think about um, you know, there's urgency and then there's your safety risk, then things that are high urgency, then the behavioral health system should be able to handle that without the use of police or the justice system at all, you know, through your crisis line, 988 mobile teams, crisis centers, et cetera. Um, the same thing when you're out in the community trying to prevent crisis, the behavioral health system should be able to, you know, follow up with people, have case management, maybe have transitional care, get people into care quickly in the first place. But then if there is a safety risk, then that is where law enforcement then involvement um, you know, becomes necessary. And there's multiple options for the police. Um, Co-responders might be an option, but we're trying to figure out who needs law enforcement and who doesn't before the point of sending anybody um, at the 911 call. But if you do need you know, find that, sometimes it's faster for a CIT trained officer just to take someone to the crisis response center rather than call for a mobile team. Um, they used to call the SWAT team for people in their house that were suicidal that they needed to get out. Um, you know, oh, you know, my police buddy said that, that doesn't really make any sense because they're not coming out for his two plainclothes guys. They're not coming out for 30 guys in a tank. So now they sometimes have the mobile crisis team come out and help them do that. Um, and then there are these dedicated teams that and that's really where the traditional co-response kind of makes a little bit more sense where um, these are specialty dedicated teams that are working on a specific population who are often paired with a peer. So for example, there's a homeless outreach team that has a homeless recovery peer with them. There's a substance use team that has a peer um, from one of the substance use agencies in town that helps engage with people after overdoses. And so that way you have more of a sophisticated response where you're trying to get the right response to the right person at the right point in their crisis. And this last slide is just to, for people looking for resources, um, you know, one of our key ingredients is first of all, it's the culture, a culture of trying to figure out how to say yes, rather than look for reasons to say no, because you know, mental health kind of has a reputation for being hard to access and you have to flip that. Um, but also there's a resource, um, I was part of the group that helped write it uh, called the Roadmap to the Ideal Crisis System that lays out a lot of these, these issues. And it encompasses a lot of what's covered in the crisis guidelines. It's more of a, it's a companion to the, to the crisis guidelines, but also talks about the oversight, the accountability, the financing, the data, um, things like that, that you need to make a whole system function as a system. Thank you, Margie. So appreciate you going um, a little bit deeper into what is happening in your region and recognizing that the 988 is is um, a piece of a component in a whole continuum of crisis care that must be grounded in values to support the collaborative work that is required. So with that, we are gonna move on to our next panelist who is CJ and I invite CJ to introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is CJ Lucell. I'm the crisis administrator here at ACCESS, which is the Medicaid agency uh, for Arizona. 
I have been the crisis administrator here only since last November, but I've been with Access for a very long time. Um, we've just recently developed a crisis unit uh, that was an Access initiative in response to the, the really quickly changing uh, landscape of crisis care na on a national level, uh, not just in Arizona. Um, I'm very passionate about crisis response and suicide prevention. I'm a suicide loss survivor myself. Um, and I have been a part, a person who's contacted crisis um, in trying to get help for a loved one. So breaking down barriers and making it easier for people to connect with services that are appropriate in a crisis um, is, is very, very near and dear to my heart. So I'm very, very uh, grateful to have the, the job that I have with Access and work with the wonderful team of uh, health plans and providers and uh, state agency partners that I do. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. In Arizona, as, as Dr. Belfour mentioned, we've had a longstanding crisis response network uh, that's operated by our regional behavioral health authorities. These are contracted um, managed care organizations. Uh, they receive Medicaid funding, grant funding, state-only dollars, discretionary grants, a uh, whole bunch of different types of funding that, that they are able to braid to really support a, a full system. Um, on the left side of the screen here, you'll see the NSPL system in Arizona, uh, and it's been here again since 2005. We've had uh, two NSPL contracted call centers. Uh, one of those is also one of our REBA contracted call centers. So this has given us as a state um, a really good insight into the differences of the uh, national Suicide Prevention Lifeline Network policies, procedures, processes, and requirements uh, versus those that are uh, currently and have been standing in our REPA system, uh, having a, a similar, or, or I'm sorry, a shared uh, contractor, which is very, very helpful. So in order to assist um, and really support 988 integration in Arizona, oh, I'm sorry, next slide, please. One of the main things that ACCESS has done is we've updated our contract requirements for our regional behavioral health authority and asked them to select a single statewide vendor so that we could reduce that fragmentation. Uh, we were very fortunate that our REBUS have selected Solari to be our statewide crisis vendor, who is also uh, an NSPL vendor now and, and moving into the 988 uh, suicide and Crisis Lifeline Network as, as that transitions happens. So this, this will make this very simple for our uh, callers that are calling into whether they're calling 988 or the existing 10 digit numbers, which will continue to operate here in Arizona. Um, they'll all have access to what we call our crisis care continuum. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but I kind of want to give you a volume picture. In Arizona, over the last two years, our crisis centers that are operated by the REVAs have collectively responded to about 370,000 calls per year. Our two lifeline centers combined have um, responded to about 37,000. So 90% of the crisis calls in Arizona have been fielded by these uh, REVA operated call centers and worked into our network of contracted providers, which include our mobile crisis response teams, our stabilization units, as, as Dr. Belfort was just describing our continuum in a linear fashion. Our imagination takes us to a place of, as we as outlined in the, the SAMHSA best practice or crisis system, right? A hub model being the crisis call center is the hub of our crisis care continuum. Has access, easy access for a person or a person who is calling about a loved one to contact any different level of care within the crisis care continuum. As Margie mentioned, many, many calls are resolved by phone. Um, and that is such an excellent thing because a resource where you can actually pick up the phone and at that time be connected with a trained counselor and resources that you need uh, before you're asked to leave your home um, or engage in anything more restrictive is definitely our top priority. Um, we worked very, very hard uh, in Arizona across our entire state uh, to encourage and foster relationships with our 911 administration and our PSAPs, our, our police officers, our main hospitals, um, our court systems, 
our Department of Education and individual schools that are struggling with behavioral health issues on a daily basis through several initiatives. Uh, because really, as, as uh, was stated, I think it was Margie, um, an, an ideal crisis system isn't, isn't just one thing. It's, it's not a collection of services. It's a, it's a collection of culture and buy-in, a full community response and understanding that these needs are just as emergent as a physical health need. If you're in a car accident, um, and someone calls 911, you're going to get a police officer to block traffic. You're going to get a, an emergency response team from EMS to make sure that everybody's medically okay. And you might even get a fire truck as well, you know, just in case that car catches on fire. Um, and we should, we should all be ready to respond in that collaborative manner. Now, 988 is a dialing system, a dialing code, um, as many of us have mentioned, and, and it brings with it the promise of um, a parallel to 911. But really, 988 is a tool. Um, if, you, if most of us that have been around over the past 30 years can remember that 911 didn't always start with a full coordinated response system. 911 started and a police officer responded. You know, I've heard several, several examples of during the 80s, people calling 911 for healthcare emergencies that didn't make it to the uh, emergency room because we didn't have ambulances and EMS response. Uh, police officers responded, secured the scene and tried to transport people to the hospital. Uh, those things take time and people didn't survive. And so we have to keep that in mind that as we evolve with 988 and the behavioral health system across our nation, which it's, it may not start out as perfect, but we need to make sure that people know what to expect. We need to work together to make sure that our messaging is clear and even, that our communities and our educators and our families are all understand what to expect when they contact 988. You know, a lot of folks ask me on a day-to-day -day basis, so um, after July 16th, if, if I have an emergency with my son that has mental illness, I'm going to call 988 instead of 911, and 98, someone from 988 is going to come remove him from my home. And, you know, we have to be very clear with these folks and let them know that the behavioral health system is still based on whatever, wherever you live. There are rules, there are licensure rules. Uh, those are governed by, by different state agencies and statutes and even federal regulations that put limitations on how a behavioral health responder is able to intervene in an emergency situation. And there are going to be times when a collaborative response is needed, where a police officer may need to come and assist. Uh, for health and safety. So just wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page. I know I'm, I'm running out of time. I could talk about this forever. So I will go ahead and turn it over. I believe uh, Kelly's next. Can't stress enough the need for those system partners. Uh, data sharing policies uh, within every state and every region can be very different on, on who is responsible for what, you know, in California. Uh, where David's at, it, it, every county has its own health care system, its, its own behavioral health system, right? And then here in Arizona, we're trying to really make statewide consistency a thing regardless of county. So every every state's a little different. And I think that's going to be our challenge as 911 support, 988 supporters um, is making sure that the individual communities are aware of what their system allows and requires and what supports are available. So with that, we will go ahead and turn the spotlight over to the fourth speaker in our panel, Kelly. Thank you so much. And what a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm happy to see so many uh, people interested in this topic. My name is Kelly Marshall. I'm the president of Social Entrepreneurs and we're a private consulting firm based in Nevada. We have had the privilege over the last year and a half of planning Nevada's crisis response system, which started with planning 988 and quickly evolved. Um, so I'm bringing a, a statewide perspective, uh, but also am currently leading um, a regional implementation of our state's crisis response system. So I have a little bit of the regional perspective as well. And I'll try to weave both of those in. Um, to this presentation. We can move to the next slide. And um, I really wanted to, to highlight the fact that, um, you know, with crisis, right, there is opportunity and there is also risk or chaos. Um, and uh, so many of the points I wanna make are both promising and cautionary elements. 
uh, it may have been a cautionary element that emerged from stakeholders saying to us, well, what about this? That then turns into um, a promise in that uh, we create a system to support this. So the first thing that I would note is that Nevada was one of four states early on to take model legislation and to um, push it through our legislative session. And in uh, 2021, our legislature passed um, SB 390 or Senate Bill 390, which established a fund and a fee to support 988 and crisis response services. And so what that means is that legislatively, uh, the state was already thinking that 988 by itself isn't enough. We need a crisis response system. Margie described that really beautifully. Um, but in summary, it has really three components, right? Which is that you have someone to contact or someone to call. And that if you cannot be de-escalated, then you have someone to come and respond to you. David described that as those mobile teams, right? And then um, if, if you are still in need of more care and um, need more supports wrapped around you, then you have a safe place to go. Those are the crisis stabilization facilities. And when you put those three pieces together and you bake into them these essential principles and practices that it's trauma-informed, that you're using peers, that you have strong partnerships, then you have a crisis response system. So Margie and CJ both talked about their crisis response system. Nevada doesn't have one yet, but we are really uh, leveraging all of their wisdom and lessons learned. And we now have a funding stream, which is this crisis response account, which has been established that will um, put a 35 cent uh, fee on phone lines, whether mobile or landlines uh, to support crisis response uh, all of those pieces, right? Someone to talk to, someone to respond and a safe place to go. And so one of our um, promising pieces is to say, no, we are gonna just plan for, for 988 going live. We need to build this entire system. So plan for that entire crisis response system. And to do that and to really have kind of the um, political and public will, we needed to engage as many partners as soon as possible but to leave our doors open and to continue to bring people in. So we have a planning coalition right now uh, that started with 16 people from a variety of disciplines who had been identified as uh, key partners that needed to participate. It is now 90 people. People continue to forward messaging or an email that we send to other folks. And they say, can we learn more about this? And we say, would you like to be on our mailing list? And then they're in and they're invited to our monthly planning coalition meetings or they get a weekly email update that says, here's new funding that has just come in. Um, so when David was talking about the $20 million that just came in, we just got a million dollar grant. Now that is significantly smaller than California, right? We have about 3 million people, uh, but we just got a million dollar grant specifically to address workforce. And so $500,000 a year for the next two years. This is from SAMHSA, who's also sponsoring this conference. And that is to hire uh, agents, right? Contact agents. So we talk about contacts rather than calls, chats, and texts, because there's different modalities that people, particularly younger people, will use. They are more likely to chat or to text. Um, and so we need to kind of mirror our communication style uh, to their preferences. Um, so engaging all of these interested parties and then keeping the door open so that people can jump on this crisis response system slash 988 train as it's about to leave the station at whatever point uh, they're interested in. Um, you've heard some of this already, but it's really important to differentiate between the crisis response system and the ongoing behavioral health system. So some people think that, okay, um, now my, my person, my important person is going to get the ongoing help that they need. 
And those linkages, those follow-ups and referrals are a critical part of the crisis response system. But the crisis response system is distinct in that it really is for that moment that a person is in uh, what we call a behavioral health or suicidality crisis. And it's to stabilize them and link them with the ongoing behavioral health system so that they have that ongoing care. Um, the crisis response system is not like a silver bullet that will replace uh, right, the existing system. It is augmenting. It's like the tip of the spear almost. One of the other things that uh, we were cautioned and that we um, understand to be really important is the need to distinguish between the children, youth, and family system and the adult system. And a lot of the resources that initially were rolled out we're around the adult system. And in Nevada, we have a lot of experience of systems being designed for the adults and then laid over onto a children, youth and families. And those are two different populations, right? And they have different needs, they have different partners. And so um, we wanted to acknowledge that really early on. Uh, so for example, our state just pushed out a bunch of dollars and they asked for mobile crisis teams for children and youth and mobile teams separately for adults. They asked for crisis stabilization centers. Those are those so safe places to go for both adults specifically and for children and youth separate from that. Um, so really acknowledging those differences. Um, and then the, the overarching thing throughout this whole process has been to understand that change management principles are at play here, right? This is significant once in a generation change that we are experiencing. And so it requires ongoing change management, also capacity building to shore up different parts of the system. We have a state net nationally accredited suicide prevention lifeline. It is serving our entire state. It's also one of the national backup centers that takes rollover calls from other states. We had that piece. We had some co-responder, co-responder meaning law enforcement um, with um, you know, a clinician, mobile teams. We have certified community behavioral health centers, um, but we are building the mobile crisis part and the crisis stabilization center piece. And so all of this, including the funding takes time. Let's go to the next slide. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, kind of some of the rising practices policies and what we think have been successful strategies thus far. So I talked about that planning coalition. I just wanna say that it has representation and we're continuously looking at it to say, um, like one of the gaps for us were our, um, tribal entities and sovereign nations. And so uh, we did specific outreach for, for, um, to bring those partners in. Um, so continuously look at that. Um, we utilized Margie's uh, roadmap to the ideal crisis system and national guidelines that have been published. And stay tuned because national guidelines for the children's system um, for a crisis system should be coming. We need to acknowledge different partners' needs and concerns. Um, we've talked to the statewide school safety task force to really seek to understand what their issues are. Um, and I've already mentioned the different children's mobile crisis team, um, as well as co-responders, but separating out children and adults, understanding different partners, different populations have different needs. Um, CJ talked about like, the no wrong door and that technology piece and David referenced that as well. We also are planning that crisis hub to facilitate client-centered care, that information sharing and warm handoffs. And the training piece has been on our mind from the very beginning. So we have a lot of training resources. Uh, we're trying to push those out to partners who may have had pieces of it, like certified um, uh, zero suicide training, but maybe haven't had de-escalation training. Um, so we're working again with all these different subpopulations and partners to leverage that training. So I just want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. Um, one is that peers are a critical component of the crisis response system. Um, this whole initiative 
988 itself should destigmatize mental health and it should also destigmatize the experience that people like peers or people who have walked in those steps before have experienced. Um, we have engaged with higher ed, with training centers and with statewide workforce development initiatives um, early to uh, take the steps necessary to embed in policy the curriculum um, around crisis response. And we're currently convening the 911 and 988. So that's that interoperability or coordination between police or 911, um, police, fire, and ambulance with 988 uh, so that um, we can really reinforce those warm handoffs and have the right response at the right time. I would, I would leave you with um, one last thought, which is the communication is really critical. Uh, people are really right now getting very interested. They're seeing articles about 988 and they want to know more. And so it's really important to, to let them know that if you have, you know, a fire uh, police or medical emergency, you call 911. They're the public safety resource. If you have suicidality or a behavioral health crisis, you call 988 after, on or after July 16th. Um, and that we continue to gear messages differently for parents than teachers, uh, than children, um, um, and that we acknowledge cultural and linguistic differences as well. So I leave you with these two resources. Um, we used both of them, they were integral for our planning process. And thank you so much for your time. What training and outreach is being done to connect with the entities that will be responding to preserve life when this is determined to be necessary on a crisis call. Uh, yes, thank you. So when you're look, uh, thinking of what training we're doing, a lot of it's that suicide 101 and education to both our law enforcement, the CIT components that we're doing around there uh, that with our communities. Uh, we go out and do a lot of outreach and um, with our behavioral health partners, and that's really been strengthened over the past several years because of our suicide prevention collaboratives. So if there's any collaboratives that are going out there that you already have established, I would say connect with them and look at what resources are available for that. And then what we're doing as a center is really going out to our communities or each of our stakeholder counties and making it a point, this is the service that we have right now. This is what it's going to look like and informing all of our, our stakeholders and community partners along with the public on what this resource will be. Um, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline does not work in all rural areas. Will the 988 be more robust to respond to those areas? Arizona struggles with that. We've got some really, really rural tribes ourselves. I think we should probably tweet Elon Musk to turn on Starlink maybe for those populations, but um, CJ probably has more info on how that's been addressed. I don't know exactly what the difference will be um, as of July 16th. I know that Lifeline and SAMHSA, uh, Vibrant, who is the, the Lifeline Administrator in SAMHSA, are very aware as uh, states like Arizona, who has 22 tribes and, and several of those in very rural areas have voiced that the, the network has uh, been reported to us as stop being accessible in some areas. We, we also have, even in our own REWA operated system, some uh, difficulties with the ability to just get cell phone services um, on, on certain areas of tribal lands. Um, in Arizona, one of the things that we worked on for our REBA system with that is, is to work really hard with tribes and try and support them um, any way that we can, helping them find funding for infrastructure, establishing memorandums of understanding directly with tribes um, and our providers or our REBAs. Uh, so that they can gain right of entry, so that they can they can come to um, a person in crisis on tribal lands. Um, but as far as uh, overall um, changes to the the lifeline network availability in those rural areas, it would really be a, a, a SAMHSA vibrant question on what they've done to really um, 
expand there. I know the 988 transition really is a dialing code. It's the telephony services transferring 988 um, into that 1-800-273-TALK line that's already existing. So that other backend stuff, there's not a lot of information been, been sent out, but it has been a topic of several conferences that I've been in. So I, I know they're, they're aware. And that kind of leads into a question that I, I know came up and was referenced at the end, um, Kelly, when you were talking about the cultural competency considerations when it comes to 988. So this is really a question for any one of the panelists, but curious to find out what, um, you know, we talked a bit about at the end about specific systems for youth and families, curious around what the thinking is around what might need to be done for different cultural groups around access to 988. I know for the crisis line in the Southern region, they have tribal liaisons who, they do a lot, um, but one of the things they're able to do is if, someone calls from one of the tribal nations, they can get one of those liaisons to also join the call to mm -hmm. kind of be a bridge. And so I know that's one thing that's being done to make sure that, um, you know, the, and I know they do a lot of outreach and um, you know, a lot of work with the different tribal nations that they serve to make sure that they're meeting their needs. I'm um, speaking to the cultural competent and understanding the diverse um, community and service lines that we will have. Um, one of the things that is really being a strong initiative for us is to actually um, staff a team that is inclusive and is comprised of a very different cultural backgrounds and respecting everyone. So that way we're getting that not only are we responding um, well as an organization with the culturally competent but inclusive environment, and you also learn from each other in, in that working environment. So it's just better understanding along with the education along with going out there and servicing whatever that unique catchment area may be for your communities. But because it is a national number, and even though they will be routed into a local crisis center, there is the potential that those outside your network will come in every once in a while, like we were a backup center before. So it is very important that we understand both the re local resources and you know are culturally competent across the board for both youth you know, through all stages of life. Also about, um persons with different abilities, mm -hmm. right? And so having um, the TDD capability, I think there's like translation lines, um, maybe David or, or uh, CJ could speak more to that. Um, but um, I believe that the su National Suicide Prevention Lifelines have access to translation. Um, at the local level, right, we're trying for just as David said, um, you know, diverse, inclusive, um, representative agents to be answering those calls, chats, and texts. So I think that's that's the starting point. But um, the lifeline itself has, does have access to a variety of different languages, and we're in Nevada um, really pushing for bilingual staff as well, and and um, hoping for diversity, including LGBTQ plus partners, because that is a population um, that experiences suicidality at a greater rate than, than other populations. Uh, and I think the strategy around inform, um, ensuring that peers are engaged in this process also helps with that um, representation as well that you all talked about. Vera put out, Vera Institute of Justice, um, for those who were on the Wednesday crisis calls, they recently presented a report they put out that actually talks about how peers can help an organization have a workforce that represents the population it serves, since the demographics of you know, your professional staff may not mirror that. And so to be more inclusive, hiring here, I'll put it in the chat, but it was an interesting report the um a dist distinction between the crisis care system and the existing behavioral health system as well you know whenever there's like people talk about emergency room boarding and things like that um it seems like the the first response is always that we need more beds and that's why i love nash bids um report that they put out years ago that was called beyond beds and it mm. talks about how we need to think beyond beds and that if you have a robust crisis, you have a robust continuum of care to begin with, with really good access and good follow-up, 
you don't have as many people in crisis. And then if you have a good crisis system, then you can get people's crisis resolved in community-based care without having to have people in inpatient beds. And so our philosophy has always been that, um, that you want, the solution isn't just beds, you want the right people in those beds. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we've, uh, you know, we try to build the crisis system out so that more people can get their, their, you know, their crisis resolved without that. That said, um, you know, there's differences in the different, you know, there's inpatient beds, um, there's, and this is where every state is different. And I'm glad that a lot of the national legislation is talking about creating a national crisis coordinating office at SAMHSA or HHS or whatever, that's going to maybe lay out some standards for this because you've got crisis residential and you've got subacute and you've got inpatient. Um, our crisis centers are an ob the observation model is more like with recliner chairs that lay flat. So they're not licensed as beds in Arizona. We we're you know, working in other states now and some states don't have a way to license that at all. Mm. Um, you know, some states, it has to be inpatient states. It has to have a certificate of need even though it's a crisis bed. So all of that is just a mess nationwide. Partnering with schools. Uh, so uh, there was conversation at at the beginning, definitely about partnership and ensuring that that is a, a, an important way of looking at the process of launching these systems. And so was curious to hear a little bit more about what kind of um, partnerships you know of or are seeing around um, working with school mental health providers. So we've been working with our Department of Education, which is overarching of the state, as well as our um, our Nietzsche, which is our, um, our community and higher education mm -hmm. system. And um, one of the simple things that we're doing right now is coordinating with them because currently um, students' ID cards have the 10 digit number on them. So we're transitioning their IDs, right? Uh, starting with the summer, um, to that three digit number. So it'll say if you're having a behavioral health or suicidality crisis, or you feel like harming yourself, call 988 or call chat or text 988. Um, so that's like a, a partnership at the systems level. And then I mentioned I had already talked with our uh, statewide uh, safety task force because they are the ones that are currently in schools responding to these crises. So. Um, the first piece I would say is education to let them know what 988 is, um, how it's rolling out, what other components of the crisis response system um, are, are in the queue and how that's going to be um, enabled. And then we have two really larger school districts, the largest being Clark County, which is the Las Vegas area. And then um, in Northern Nevada, it's, it's Washoe County School District but we have 15 other rural school districts. And so remembering that relationships that last, right? You have to build relationships, not just with the large systems, but also understanding rural and frontier areas and that their system is completely different. And so that's like a lot of one-on-one -on -one outreach, um, engaging with school principals, school counselors, um, and as well as uh, structuring a communication mechanism so that people are getting the right messages and know what to do. Yes, yes, thank you. So in, in Arizona, part of our contract with our REBAs requires that the REBAs work uh, collaboratively with uh, law enforcement, but also our Department of Education and, and other community events. And one of the big things I really want to talk about with partnering with schools is, uh, you know, that that intervention and that partnership should really take place long before uh, there becomes a crisis. Uh, you know, schools are, are so overcrowded and so many children are really struggling 
post pandemic, coming back to school, um, and just in today's environment. So, um, really want to encourage uh, if you if you're going to start an education program partnership with your providers, don't focus just on crisis. So it's the same as um, in children's crisis in any way. You know, the, the focus really needs to be on how can we prevent ch children from being removed from their home. What wraparound services and connection to care can we get to those kiddos up front and present Preserve the family unit. Um, and really, that's a lot of what the behavioral health in schools is focused on here in Arizona is really educating teachers on resources they can use when they, they think they might suspect somebody's about to have a problem. Uh, once it becomes a crisis, of course, they can contact our crisis lines, our mobile teams respond to schools. Um, but again, that, that can be a, a secondary trauma for a child who's already experiencing a crisis, having strangers come into the classroom and talk to you and take you away from campus in a car to go somewhere with, the, you know, th this can all be embarrassing and add to childhood trauma. And we want to really prevent that and get on the front end when it comes to treating children um, who've experienced trauma or maybe experiencing behavioral crisis. Uh, so some of the strategies that we've done is really, um, through the suicide collaboratives that we've had in the Valley in, in California, it's uh, really pushing the Columbia suicide rate rating scale, the screener. So that way we can all have like a, a universal language, not only just teaching it to the clinicians that are embedded in schools, but also the, the teachers. So they become more aware. And a lot of the schools and uh, school leadership has really allowed uh, the educators themselves to be um, more versed in assist or suicide 101 type trainings which helps really enhance the surveillance that we have in our community, because that's also an effort so everyone can actually understand what the signs are in suicide prevention, and they can recognize that, and then how they can actually have that conversation. And we're looking at the surveillance piece. It should really be inclusive throughout our community, but speaking to the school systems as well. It's like at all levels, you know, from the bus drivers to our, to our kitchen staff, to our people out there, like, Anyone that can have contact with youth, you know, it's a, it's a great opportunity to just increase the, the capacity that we have right now. Yeah, I, and I'm a data nerd, and so I'm a big believer in using data to help prevent crisis. And so that's one thing we did is we partnered with our REBA and looked at, you know, we were able to identify outlier schools that were sending more than they should have, you know, just based on, you know, their size and everything. Um, to to crisis and so then the reba was able to put in school services targeted at those schools specifically um to try to like cj said you you don't want it to get to the point of there are a ton of new products from our center and upcoming events thank you to david margie cj and kelly for guiding our conversation today